the uh, trip through the Midwest visiting family with Austin's uh, mother. And so uh, Cindy will be um, leading children's church today. So I would dismiss the children, K through grade five, for um, children's church. Several weeks ago, we began a um, series of messages uh, looking at a number of the prayers, three of them actually, that are recorded in Scripture that um, Paul prays for the different uh, groups of people there. And we're looking particularly at the way that we could, uh, the things we could learn from Paul's prayers that would help us more successfully be God's instrument to transform others. We want to pray the kind of prayers that um, we can be God's instrument to bring about transformation. And so um, we began the first week looking at um, Paul's prayer to the Ephesians church, pray for enlightened hearts. And we recognize that the Ephesians church church was a congregation Paul had spent three years with, visited on several occasions, and uh, that this was a congregation with um, some significant um, challenges. There was ongoing needs for transformation in their lives. And then last week, we looked at um, the prayer in Philippians, um, a church that um, commentators pretty much agree was Paul's favorite church, the church most loved. And I suggested it was because it was the church that best represented in its body the, um, the values of the gospel, um, uh, rich uh, participation of all social economic groups, all cultural groups in that uh, small body. And um, we looked at Paul's prayer. Today, um, the prayer for um, the church at Colossae, the, the, the book of Colossians. And what we know about this church is that Paul never visited there. So, each week I invited you to make application in thinking about how to pray for people that fit the category that um, um, Paul was writing to. And so, today, I invite you to think about people you care about that you actually never met. Okay? People you care about, people that you're concerned about, that you've never actually been face to face with. How do you pray for such people that God might use you to be an agent of transformation? I'm going to invite all who are able to stand for the reading of the word of the Lord from Colossians 1, 9 through 13. And you will find this in the uh, bulletin on the back side of the um, prayer list. This then is the word of the Lord. Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life and may please him in every way. Growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power. So that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves together, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Amen and amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 
So I've entitled the message, Pray Knowledge Would Abound, because I noted that um, in, this mess, in this prayer, um, Paul's um, praying particularly that their knowledge would increase. Now, the skeptic in me wondered whether Paul um, leaned a little in the direction of being tempted to think that because they'd never actually heard him preach, they might have an inferior knowledge. <laughs> Um, and, you know, there might be some truth to that. We preachers um, tend to um, sometimes uh, overestimate uh, our abilities to um, um, be God's instrument to address precisely what people need. And Paul had never been to this church. So he prays that their knowledge would enlarge and expand their knowledge of God and other kinds of things that uh, we'll be looking at. But there's also hints in the letter itself that although this also is a fairly healthy congregation and there doesn't seem to be anything severely out of order, there's hints that, that there's some, um, some theology, some understandings that are beginning to take root that if they flourish and grow will indeed um, not be good for the church, not be good for their work. In other words, there's, there's hints of what could become a, a, a heresy. And it's not directly named or addressed, at least the commentators that I read in my own reading through the book, there's, it, it, you don't, you know, Paul doesn't completely name it like he does in some other places, but you can pay attention to the letter and the things that he emphasizes give you hints. And throughout this letter, um, Paul is um, um, essentially lifting up the reality that Jesus was enough more than enough, that Jesus was fully sufficient, that um, he's fully adequate. In chapter 1, um, um, he says he's, you know, that, that in Christ all the fullness of God dwells. And in chapter uh, 2, um, talks about the treasures of wisdom residing in Jesus. And in chapter 2, uh, verse 9, that in Christ was the fullness of the Godhead. So, you know, if you, if you just pay attention, you, you, you might assume that, um, yeah, that they were raising some questions about the sufficiency of Christ that Paul is, is saying, okay, now let's get this, let's get this straight. Jesus was fully enough. He was not just a good teacher. He wasn't just a, um, a, a fully sufficient Lord. He was actually the full representation of God. The, you, you, you've seen Jesus, as, as Jesus himself said, you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. There's nothing more, okay? Um, in uh, chapter 1, um, verse 16, um, Paul emphasizes that uh, Christ was in, involved in, in creation. So, um, again, we assume that that's part of why Paul on the front end prays that their knowledge of God, their knowing of God, and their understanding of God would deepen and would be enlarged. Now, for those of you who weren't uh, present, the um, first two messages, let me just emphasize what we've discovered as a theme in the way Paul prays for these people that he cares about. What we've discovered is that every time Paul prays, in ways that bless people, in ways that lift out the reality of God's blessing on them, declares the grandeur of God, the blessing of God, blesses the people, strengthens them, encourages them before he gets into the letter where he names the things that are out of order, the places that they yet need growth, the places where they've fallen short. And I uh, acknowledged um, to the congregation that I felt drawn to myself spend time in these prayers because I too am wrestling to know what does it mean to be God's instrument when God entrusts to us very broken people who want to grow up into, into Jesus. How can we do it? And part of what I've seen um, in these uh, letters is before we name what's out of order, although that must be done, 
before we challenge the growth areas, though that's critically important, we must first build them up, name the reality of who God is, have them kind of breathe deeply the reality of the love of God in them, and then we name what's out of order and we invite them to, um, to, um, to, to grow into those uh, places where they yet need to be more like Jesus. So that's been the theme and today in making application. I invite you to think again um, out of this prayer, uh, before we look in more deeply into this prayer in making application, think again about people that you care about that you never have never met. I have some first cousins I've never met. There were a hundred first cousins. I've never met some of them. Um, but they're family. Um, the scriptures tell us we're to pray for leaders in our country. Most, I doubt if many of us have ever met um, the governor of Pennsylvania. I doubt if many of us have ever met the president of the United States. The scripture says we're to pray for these people. These are people most of us have never met. So you think of an application, someone you've never met, that you're to pray for. Well, the way Paul prays for people he never met. What I see in the, um, in the um, prayer is, first of all, he prays that God would fill them with a knowledge of God's will. That seems like an appropriate uh, prayer to pray for um, um, civic leaders who say that they're followers of Jesus. Um, pray that God would fill them with the knowledge of God's will. And we hope that they get it, this filling of the knowledge of God's will. Paul is essentially modeling in this prayer what Jesus himself modeled and instructed when the disciples came to Jesus and said, wow, Lord, we, we notice, this isn't what they said, but um, I'm, I'm kind of setting a background here. Um, the disciples had noticed that Jesus was effective in his ministry more than what they were. Jesus had authority. When there's just the disciples that noticed that. When Jesus spoke something, things happened. When Jesus moved around, the landscape changed. And so, um, I'm talking in a spiritual, emotional um, landscape. Um, and so the disciples said, uh, Jesus, uh, teach us. Teach us how to pray, because obviously you're doing something in connecting with God that we haven't gotten on to. And so Jesus taught them. He said, well, here's how you pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy, holy is your name. And what comes next? What did Jesus instruct them next? Pray your will to come. Your will to be done. Father in heaven, your will to be done on earth as it's already fully being done in heaven. Let me be your instrument. Let us be your instruments to bring about more of the Father's will where it's already being fully carried out down to earth where it yet needs to be more fully applied. So there Jesus in a similar way Praise that the kingdom would come and the will would be done. Pray God would fill these people we do not know. Fill them with a knowing of his will. We also see that um, Paul invites us to be persistent about this. To press into it. To persevere. And to praise that these people that he's praying for, that they too would persevere into spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, how do we get a deeper knowledge of God's will? How do we, how do we change the mind so that the mind has a greater capacity to know and understand what is God's will versus what is our will? Well, the first that comes to mind, obviously, is you, you get this book, 
the Holy Scriptures off the shelf or um, onto your um, uh, smartphone or however you read, you, you get it. You, you, you download it or you open it and you spend time in it. Okay? Time in the Scriptures because the, um, the Spirit of God has declared through the inspiration of the writers that this is not just ink on paper, although it is that. It is unique. It is set apart amongst the literature of the world. Why? Because God has breathed his very breath into this one book. God has breathed his very life into the words of this book. So, if we want to know the will of the Father, the best place to start is spend genuine time in this tool, this gift, this amazing resource that he's um, put into our hands. How else can we know the will of God? Well, we follow after Jesus. We spend time in scriptures. But Jesus over and over again said to his disciples, follow me. Get up from what you're doing and start tracking along. So there's a certain reality of knowing that only happens when we get moving, when we partner with Jesus, when we begin giving our life energy to imitate Jesus. That's what we mean by following. And Jesus says, those who love me will be the ones who obey my commands. Um, so making Jesus your Savior and Lord is a wonderful place to start, but it isn't really going to transform your life until you begin um, following after, begin aiming to have your life be reflective of the teachings of Jesus, the character of Jesus, the essence of Jesus, the qualities of Jesus, which is why our mission statement here at Conestoga that we affirmed a number of years ago, the words we put on page is that God calls us to know and follow Christ. As we live his story together, joyfully inviting the Holy Spirit to pour through us, offering healing and hope to the world. So it's that reality of following after Christ, knowing Jesus, that is first and foremost. And then the living of his story, because he's still active in the world. He's still doing stuff. He's still transforming. His kingdom is going out, pushing back against darkness, the light of the gospel. And we want to be part of that. We want to live his story, not just our story. And we want to live it together because we believe that that's the only way to be effective. You can't be an effective Christian isolated from other Christians. It's a communal body of Christ that has its greatest impact in the world. And that's the third thing that I would lift out to gain a deeper knowledge of God's will. We study the scriptures, we follow Christ, and we connect with the people of God because none of us are going to ever get it right. None of us are going to come close to reaching maturity, isolated and alone. Read through the New Testament. There's all kinds of one another commands, all kinds of, um, of uh, instructions as to what it means to be part of the family, connected and encouraging and building one another up. So pray God would fill them, these people we don't know, but these people we're praying for, pray God would fill them with the knowledge of His will. The second thing I see in the text is, pray they would know God's very self. Growing in the knowledge of God. Not, not, not just knowing God's will, but knowing God. And there is a difference. There's all kinds of theologians and philosophers who can articulate the will of God. They can write theories about God. But how well is God known to them? 
How well is God known to us? We don't want to just know what the scriptures tell us about God. Though I just said that's important. We want to know him deep within us. The, um, this is always a little tricky to make this point, but it's a biblical point. So I'm going to make it. The reason it's tricky is because sex and sexuality has become such a, um, oh, an idolatry in our culture. And it's become so perverted um, in its cultural expressions that it's hard to um, um, think about um, using it as an illustration in the way the scriptures do. But the reality is the scriptures in the creation account, when it says Adam knew Eve, what follows next is she bore a son. So that word knowing is that biblical word for a deep intimacy, for um, sexual union, okay? Um, again, one has to be careful in this culture about you know, where one goes with that because there's obviously nothing, nothing sexual about our relationship with God. But the scriptures use that illustration to say our intimacy with God ought to go to that level of a deep, deep, profound experience of vulnerability and knowing and commitment and cherishing and we're to know God and we're to invite him to deep into the recesses of our hearts and our souls to know us. Pray we would know God's self. And that the knowing would be in such a way that we accomplish imitating Christ. We accomplish with our actions following after and reflecting Christ. We imitate his sacrifice. We imitate the strength that it takes to live in obedience to the will of the Father. Sam and Jill are um, again, um, um, or not again, but um, in a new extension of their ministry, um, offering this fall two new workshops um, for men, marathon men, reflecting the um, uh, Hebrews 2 text where men are invited and challenged to be running the race running it with integrity and strength. The race that's set out before us. and Guarding the hearts from anything that would distract. And uh, Jill, a um, small group for um, women, titled The Value of You. Because what Jill has discovered in her counseling work with women is the primary theme is um, low self-image. An inadequate understanding that God values them, um, empowers them, cherishes them. Um, so for the women, the value of you. For the men, marathon men. As a way of being in obedience to the will of the Father, as a way of being sacrificial, as a way of being strong to accomplish what God has called us to. The final thing I see in the prayer this morning for people we don't know Pray they would know God's will. Pray they would know God's self. And pray they would know God's rewards. I remember um, uh, when I was first called into the new work of serving as an intentional interim pastor um, where you're called into congregations that have just been through a conflict or a pain or they're highly divided um, um, one from another and you're called in to be God's instrument to try to bring about uh, healing and reconciliation um, within that body and I had the privilege of doing that kind of work for uh, 10 years 
in um, five different congregations, specifically as an interim pastor, and then a number of other congregations in more of a consulting kind of way. And because I had never specifically done that kind of focused, um, narrow, narrowly focused kind of work, um, I asked for resources and got whole file folders full of resources, as well as met with uh, people who um, God had uh, already been using to do this kind of work so that I might uh, grow in my capacity. And one of the, um, one of the I, I learned many things from talking with those individuals, learned many things from reading through the articles, but one of the things that stood out was an author who said, people will only change by two motivations. The pain of life as it is either needs to be so bad that they're motivated to change or the alternative that you're inviting them towards needs to be so good that they're motivated for change. In other words, we don't just change easily. We kind of like the status quo because it's comfortable. And sometimes even people, you know, we look in on their lives and we wonder, why aren't they more motivated to change? We look at the mess of their life and we think, that would motivate me. But for them, that's what they know. And at least they know the consequences of the sin of life and in its chaos at whatever level it is. And sometimes... They're not motivated to change until the chaos gets so bad they just can't stand it any longer. That's what people who work with addicts called bottoming out. So, motivated to change either when it gets so bad we just can't stand it anymore and we change or the alternative is so sweet compared to the present that we're motivated to change. Now, two of the five churches that I, went in, that I was called into, I would say the conflict had gotten so bad, they were motivated to change because they just couldn't stand it anymore. It was like the barn had burnt down and they knew they had to get out of the mess that they had made. So they were motivated by the mess, the shame, the pain, the brokenness in relationships, the, the breaking off of effective witness. They were motivated to change because the pain, they just couldn't stand it. Those were the two churches that were the easiest to actually lead them into new places. How does God get us to change? We have the uh, sweet, sweet um, pictures of heaven and the promises of God's glory and the promises of the presence of God, not just in some far off place, but in, in the here and now to worship him and fellowship with him. And, you know, we have these beautiful incentives of an alternative to now that could motivate us, but if that doesn't motivate us to change, what might? Well, Paul prays that these people he's praying for would know the rewards of God so they'd be motivated to change. And he talks about uh, they would know the light versus the darkness. In other words, their eyes would be open to see the reality of darkness versus light. And they'd get in touch with the true consequences of sin and bondage so they could choose going towards freedom and light. He prays that they would uh, understand the inheritance that comes to all of us who are followers of Jesus. That's pretty rich. That's pretty significant of a reward. And then he wraps up the text and wraps up the prayer, praying they would know redemption. They would know, they would know, they would know the forgiveness of sin. So just because, in case you're here this morning and 
you've never known redemption. You've never known the joy of knowing sins are forgiven. Let me tell you how you can know. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned. No exceptions. Every man, woman, every member of the human race, so you're not an exception. Neither are any of the rest of us. All of us who have given our lives to Christ and said yes when he died on the cross, he was holding there our sins and that was the Son of God on that cross. And God took him down off that cross and raised him from the dead. Um, all of us who have, who have um, made that declaration, we too have declared we are sinners in need of a Savior. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No exceptions. Romans 6.23 says the wages or the payout of sin is death. That's a pretty... Sobering paycheck. Continue in sin. Fail to embrace the salvation of Christ. And there's a paycheck, a payment that's coming. It's death. But the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. What a fantastic alternative. And in Romans 10.9 says here's how you transition out of the pathway towards death to the pathway of life. You confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Let it come out of your lips. Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. So if you've never made that declaration and never transitioned into the knowing of God, let today be the day you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And give over to the belief in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And for all of us who have been longtime followers of Jesus, let's just deepen that reality, that recognition, and let's pray these kind of prayers for the people God has called us to intercede for so that we too, with the Apostle Paul, can be instruments of transformation. Amen? Amen.